discover how to create a really awesome steampunk machine in Blender. Have you ever tried to create a steampunk machine in Blender? Think about it for a moment. And I'm Gleb Alexandro for CreativeShrimp.com, the place where artists learn to create computer graphics. So, if you tried to create a steampunk in Blender, you probably know that it is insanely hard. And personally, I was so frustrated then I tried to create something steampunk in Blender. It didn't look like a steampunk at all. It didn't look epic. It looked horrifying. But eventually, I developed a workflow that helps me to create decent stuff, actually. And I want to share with you the 15 precise steps that you need to do to create a steampunk machine in Blender. To create something believable. Something that you can show to other people and not be ashamed about it. So, keep watching and let's jump straight into the tutorial. So, we'll be creating this kind of a steampunk train and let's name the steps one by one, so to get this suspense going on. Obviously, the, the step number one will be to invent a time machine, two, find a great reference, three, learn to steal like an artist, draw a concept art, that's important, block out a basic model, distribute the shapes in the most appealing way, then add the details. The next step will be to find an epic camera angle, Ta-da! Set up a dramatic lighting. Create a simple material. Then we're going to make more elaborate materials. Create additional light sources. And of course, an epic background. And we're gonna add a steam and lighting effects and post-process the image. So, let's start with an inspiration. If you need inspiration, I'd recommend you to do the following steps. First, invent a time machine and travel to future. Maybe you will see your own work published in a magazine. And it will make everything so much easier. You can take this as a reference. And by the way, this is 3D Artist magazine, issue 79. Very interesting issue. But you know, if you don't have a proper knowledge to create a time machine, I recommend you to find a reference elsewhere. For example, we can find a reference on Pixabay. And this is the brief guide how to use Pixabay. First, brainstorm keywords to Search in Pixabay 3, save the coolest images to a special folder called Inspiration. And you can see just by surfing Pixabay and using keywords like trains, locomotives, I found these brilliant images. That is going to be our references. Alright, the point number three, still like an artist and read the book by Austin Kleon. That's our workflow. First, let's search for the free train models on Blendswap and we're gonna build upon it. And eventually, of course, we are going to generate our own content. And as you can see, I found some very cool models on BlendSwap. It's already looking so amazing. I'm going to start from that models. And now I'm going to draw the concept art because we need to move from the real world trains to a steampunk machine. Uh, now let's render a side view and import this to Photoshop. So we can sketch on top of our rendering. And you don't need to be very good at painting concept art. Just import this side view rendering in Photoshop or to GIMP and start imagining the steampunk details of how you can turn this real life model into something sci fi or steampunk or whatever. Take your time and don't worry if your sketch looks funny because my sketches look awful and very funny, believe me. And uh, so, point number five block out a basic model. Alright, by now we should have um, two main things that will help us to create a steampunk machine of epic proportions. First, we have a sketch or a concept art. And secondly, we have models from BlendSwap. And here I've just modeled some uh, additional parts to get it closer to my vision. Uh, what I'm doing here, I'm just playing with additional geometry on top of original models from BlendSwap. And I'm trying to make it look like a concept art that they've painted. And when you're satisfied with the result, and I am satisfied, it's time to distribute the shapes. Nell Blevins, in his amazing tutorial of a shape distribution, said that if your image has a nice distribution of big, medium and small shapes, the resulting image will tend to be more pleasing to the eye. And hands down, this is the best piece of advice that you can get. But what are these shapes? Imagine that you read an image a few times. First, you read the biggest shape. And usually it's very rough approximation, in case of my train it's a cylinder. Then you read for the second time. And you notice the secondary details 
and they are distributed not uniformly but in some meaningful way. So there are areas with no details and areas with very dense details. And this is the third rate. And when we combine all the levels of details, we get very appealing result according to Neil. Luckily, the blend swap models already have a very nice distribution of shapes, so we'll just move to the point number seven. Add the details, add the third read. And you may ask, why should you add the details? There are three functions of details. First, to add a visual interest. Second, to enhance the impression of scale. And the third thing, and probably the most important one, to contribute to some particular setting. In case of our steampunk, it's obviously to contribute to steampunk setting. And you can see that each and every detail just adds to the scale, to visual interest, and to the mood or to the setting. All the gears, pipes, and electrical things, it just builds the setting of some Tesla-inspired steampunk world. And of course, on top of that, it looks just visually appealing to have very small details. As we said, is the third read or a tertiary shapes. Probably it's the most time-consuming part of the workflow, but it's worth it in the end, I promise you. That's my third level details. And once again, they are distributed not uniformly. There are dense areas uh, full of details and there are very flat areas. The distribution is the key to achieving a very appealing look. And after we've made a model, it's time to find an epic camera angle. This part of the process is often overlooked, but oh dear, if you fail to find a decent camera angle, you will fail to produce a nice image. That's guaranteed. So go ahead, press Shift F and start searching for the most dynamic composition. In case of this scene, I'll tweak the focal length to make it 28 to enhance the perspective, to make it look more deep, because the perspective lines will converge much more abruptly. And then I'm gonna position camera closer to the ground to get the impression, oh, I'm so small and this machine is so epic and gargantuan. All right, that looks fantastic. Let's move to setting up a dramatic lighting. And by dramatic, I mean that we're gonna create a very pronounced, very high contrast key light. And a bunch of omni lights scattered across the scene. First, I'm starting with creating an area light and placing it behind the model. That's a pretty strong key light. I make it a warmer color. And I'm placing it so it will create a rim light effect. In other words, for the most part, the model will be in shadows and will create a very strong outline. And now I'm just creating a fill light on colder one. Uh, it's a different temperature of the color, so it creates nice complementary contrast going on. Uh, it's the bicycle light setup. Later on, we will add some omni lights here and there. And usually, it's advisable to start with just having a one strong dominant light called a key light. Uh, it's a pretty simple trick, very primitive one, but I'm fine with it if it works. And oftentimes, you know, I just hate three pan lighting, but anyway. And you know, in my book, I often tell you that three-point lighting sucks and it is overused, but, but sometimes it's enough. Check out my book. All right, and now let's create a simple material. And you know, see the pattern? We start from a simple stuff and then we go in complex. We're gonna paint the texture, then set up texture coordinates, then create a shader using that texture. So I'm just launching the Photoshop and I'm composing my Uber texture using the source files from CG Textures. I'm trying to make it seamless because it will be tiled across the whole model of a train. It's a pretty big one, the 4K texture. Then I'm just creating a basic shader in Blender and plugging in this image texture as a shader input. Another tricky part, I'm not gonna use the UV coordinates during that stage. We'll be using so-called object coordinates or generated coordinates. This is procedural style of texturing. And the trick to that procedural style is to use a box mapping. So our texture is projected from different directions at once. And after we set up these object coordinates, we just need to tweak the scale and the position of the texture. That's the diffuse shader with the texture applied to the whole model at once. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, well, it isn't yet. But we are working on it, you know. Let's mix it with a glossy shader. Because in theory, uh, the model, even such dirty one, will be glossy to a certain degree. I'm gonna duplicate the texture and add a color ramp node 
to use it as a roughness input of the glossy shader. And you can see I'm previewing the nodes by pressing Ctrl Shift and clicking on the node. So I'm gonna apply this black and white texture to the roughness input to make it look more interesting. Because uniform glossiness just sucks. And the next pretty logical step would be to copy this set of nodes one more time and to plug it into Mix Factor. I'm gonna adjust the position and the scale uh, to apply more randomness to it. And then I'm plugging it into the Mix Factor node between our diffuse and glossy shaders. And here is a little aside. I like to apply the film emulation to viewport to just approximate how it will look after the post-processing. So I'm applying a film emulation here and it became darker. So I'm tweaking an exposure and gamma. And ten of my friends, I already love how it looks. The steampunk stuff gives me good vibes. And let's take our materials to the next level. Right now we have applied just one material and still it looks pretty decent, you know. So let's create the second material, just like we did before. In other words, we create a diffuse shader, mix it with a glossy shader, apply a roughness map and so on. The main difference is that we'll be using the UV texture coordinates instead of the object texture coordinates. And the reason behind this secondary shader is very obvious. It will break up the repetition and it will give us a nice color accent. I've chosen a bright red one and <laughs> it's always nice to have a splotches of color here and there. Uh, the basic workflow is to select the linked flat faces by pressing Ctrl Alt Shift F and then positioning this bunch of polygons in the image editor. And you can see that it's very easy, it's easy peasy to do that. Nothing more than selecting a bunch of polygons, uh, selecting link flat faces and then positioning it according to the texture in the image editor. But once you master this trick, you will be very confident in texturing your models. And I bet you can feel that we are getting closer to that stage where you can just share it on Facebook and not be ashamed a tiny bit about it. Alright, and now my favorite step. Let's create an additional dozen of light. And often I feel that going over the top is okay in terms of lighting, especially if you're making an epic steampunk scene. The point is, don't be shy of adding a bunch of lights if you're making a Tesla-inspired steampunk sci-fi train, because probably that will look appropriate to the setting. And at least it will look kinda cool. Uh, it will look as a toy, in a good sense. And now when you created a train, it's time to create an epic background. And we won't spend too much effort and time on making the background. I will be using this model and we'll copy it a bunch of times using the array modifier it's almost cheating, it's an easy way to get the rhythm going on and I strongly recommend you, composition-wise, to break your image into the subject and the background because usually background demands much less attention and we can get around with just painting the background in 2D. So you can see that I'm composing the background from photos that I downloaded from, uh, from Pixabay. And one more time, Pixabay saves the day and I love Pixabay. And I'm gonna apply now a bit of a depth of field to glue the things together. But don't overdo it, because it will look like a child's toy indeed. It will lose an epic sense of scale. Just throw in a little bit of depth of field. Fantastic, let's add a steam and electricity effects. In the end, we're making the steampunk machine powered by electricity. So let's apply a trickery with alpha mapped planes, like we did in a previous tutorial with spider webs. I'll be using this texture, this PNG with transparency, as a mix factor between emission and transparent shaders. Uh, the limitation of this technique is that we need to position our planes according to the camera angle, but if you compare it to simulating the smoke, it is much easier to just create a bunch of planes. Here I'm applying the color ramp to invert the transparency and also to tweak the fall off of the shader. And that is the principle behind the smoke and electricity and steam and cloud effects that you usually see in my renders. <laughs> uh, I love cheating with that kind of things because it makes the process so much easier when you can see in the viewport that you're making. And here I'm just positioning it in the viewport and previewing it in cycles. And that's what you call interactive. 
And when I've come to this stage, I just enjoy the process because it's so enjoyable <laughs> to see how you fill your scene with the smoke. It's not like running a simulation and waiting for the 75 hours. Bingo! And now let's post-process the image. That is the last, but the most important step. Usually I break it into three parts. Make sure your image is okay, use Blender Compositor, then enjoy. So let's start with overlaying the mist pass on top of the image. That will give you a nice aerial perspective. So you can see that I'm overlaying the mist pass in a screen mode. And the next step is to add a glow or a glare. That will have a great impact on all the omni lights and electricity on the bright spots in our image because it will add a soft diffuse glow, a very glamorizing effect. And now just add a fair amount of lens distortion or a chromatic aberration effect that will smudge the edges of the image and make it look like you have a lens defect. Uh, but you can safely assume that everybody would be crazy about this defect. They will love it. And the final touches would be to crank up the contrast and to add a bit of a vignette and BAM! You have arrived at the final stop of our journey. I'm super excited about what we managed to get. And now guys, I wanna just share it with you. Thanks for watching, that was Gleb Alexandrov. And if you enjoyed this video, let's make it viral. Let's share it a thousand times with other nerds that love steampunk. And I appreciate each share. And thank you so much, that was Gleb Alexandrov for Creative Shrimp, the place where artists learn to get ahead in computer graphics. And feel free to comment, to leave a comment. See you next time. I have high octane blood.